Hello, welcome to Anchorage International Airport. My name is Dennis Deering. Most people know me as Beaver Beaver. I started working out here at Anchorage International Airport about 12 years ago. And at that time, I was already an experienced electrician. But I got here and I realized that, wow, this electrical system out here is very different from anything I'd ever worked on before. Yet, it seemed very simple and it seemed very safe. So as I started learning about this system, started reading more and working with it, I kept running into this statement over and over again. Airfield electrical systems are inherently dangerous. And I thought, that seems strange, it's so simple. But over and over again, they are inherently dangerous. So I started to ask why. Now after I've been working here for 12 years, I've done a lot of research, and I will agree, airfield electrical systems are inherently dangerous. Now when I started here, I didn't know this, and yet I was working with this, and I wondered how many people who work on airfields as electricians or even as equipment operators, firemen, or possibly even laborers are working around or with these systems and don't have an idea as to how dangerous they really are. Just a little about where this film was made. So Ted Stevens Anchorage International Airport has three major runways all over 10,000 feet long and it's one of the busiest air cargo airports in the whole world. Anchorage International is home to the world's largest seaplane base and it also has an extremely busy small aircraft gravel strip. We maintain over 7,000 airfield lights and over 100 miles of cable, often under extreme weather conditions, particularly in winter. So most of what I'm about to show you is taken from real world experiences and situations. And it should apply to any airport from a major city large hub to a bush field in remote Alaska. We used to call this the monster below, and in just a little while I think you'll understand why. So at the end of this presentation, I'd like you all to understand a few things about this. Uh, the basic components of an electrical system at an air, airfield. Uh, why an electrical airfield system is different than other uh, electrical systems, such as like what we'd use in your home. How it can be more dangerous. Uh, some of the hazards and how to avoid them. And that's a lot, so I think we better get moving here. So why should you need to know about an electrical system at an airport? You may not even be a, an electrician. Well, just because it's not your job doesn't mean it can't hurt you. All of us work, or all of us that work on an airfield, work around an airfield electrical system. Whether you be an electrician or equipment operator, or a fireman, or just a laborer, if something goes wrong with that system, you might be involved or you might be near it, and it's really important that you understand it so that you can avoid the hazards. So airfield lighting works on a system called a constant current system. This is very different than a constant voltage system, which is what is used in our, in our towns, our cities, in our homes. Um, why constant current? Well, constant current gives us a constant lamp luminance over miles of wire and hundreds of lights. This particular runway here has almost four miles of lights on one circuit. Every single light on that runway is the exact same luminance. This gives pilots an accurate depth perception. So, um, so when they're coming in for landing, they, they're not confused as to how far away the lights, the, the runway is. This makes it possible because amperage is a set level that can be measured the same anywhere you are in the world we can set luminance levels that are universal. And the design is simple, very cost effective, and um, it's very, very reliable. It's much less likely to shut down because of nuisance trips. And that right there, much less likely to shut down because of nuisance trips, is why we need to have this talk right now. So all of these different Light, lights are on a runway. All of them run off of a constant current lighting system. 
So the differences between constant voltage and constant current. Constant voltage is just like it sounds. It'll be like 120 volts, 208 volts, 480 volts. It, the voltage stays steady. Constant current, the current stays steady and the voltage goes up and down. A constant, the main difference between a constant voltage and a constant current system is that constant voltage is designed for personnel safety. Personnel safety is integrated into every portion of this system. It's designed so that I can use it, you can use it, my kids can use it, anyone in the public can use it safely. Um, it's also designed to protect property from fire and other hazards. Now a constant current system, on the other hand, has absolutely no personnel safety integrated into it. It has, um, it's for professional use only. And this system is designed to keep running and, um, and keep the lights on when a plane is on short final and it does not want to shut down. So if an electrician gets tangled up into it, if a uh, equipment operator cuts into the wires, or if it starts something on fire, it doesn't care. The only reason a constant current system will shut down is because it thinks it's going to hurt itself. It's gonna go beyond its parameters and burn itself up, then it'll shut down. Otherwise, it doesn't care. So this, the constant current uh, regulator, is the monster below that we were talking about. So a constant current system is extremely simple. It, uh, it's a series loop. You have your constant current regulator. The wires come out, go through a transformer. It goes on to the next one and on through the transformers. and forms a loop back to the regulator. From the trans and these wires coming from the, the regulator can be up to 5,000 volts. We call this our primary wiring. Okay, on our Secondary side of the transformer, the wires go up to feed our lights. These are low voltage, this is low voltage wiring. It steps it down to less than 50 volts. So our lighting on an airfield is actually low voltage wi wiring. And these are low voltage lights. But to think of this as a low voltage system is extremely dangerous. And I think you'll understand why after a few slides here. Okay, let's just walk you through some of the components of our airfield. This is our airfield lighting vault. These are our regulator banks. Well, this is our airfield regulator vault. This is where all the lighting on the airfield starts. This bank of regulators is for one of our three runways. I'm gonna open one and I'll show you how it works. All right, this is one of our regulators for one of our runways. I'm gonna show you the inside, but first you need to know that before you get into one of these things, it needs to be turned off and locked out, which we've done. So there it is. This is an extremely high-powered system, and it's extremely dangerous. And again, this is the monster below that we were talking about. It does not want to shut down. It's designed to keep the lights on. All right, this is our lighting vault for Lake Hood Strip. It's a lot smaller than what we had out at Anchorage International, but it works exactly the same. It can still put out the same voltage and it's every bit as dangerous. This is something that you might have out on a small airfield, a rural airfield, or something in Bush, Alaska would be, look like this. This is our Lake Hood lighting vault for our water lane. This regulator works exactly the same as anything out on Anchorage International. It's just smaller, but it puts out the same voltages and it has the exact same dangers. Okay, from our airfield lighting vault, we go out into concrete vaults out on the airfield. This might not be the exact same way on your airfield, but this is the way it is at Anchorage. Now these lighting vaults are about eight feet deep and they have a lot of live splices or a lot of wires that come into them. They're extremely dangerous. Uh, before we go into them, we'll lock out the entire airfield. We'll send a sniffer down there to make sure the oxygen levels are correct. Then we'll check for any voltage in there 
and then we will go down in. So if you don't know exactly what you're doing, you need to stay out of these lighting vaults. Now from those lighting vaults, it goes out to the individual circuits. So this is a typical runway center line circuit, in pavement center line. It's a very simple system. Our wiring comes in on our primary voltage here, our high voltage wires, they come out, they go through our transformer, back out another wire, and it goes on to the next fixture. Our transformer steps that voltage down to a low voltage, and it comes out and goes to our light. Very simple, everything works really well. It's uh, easy to work on and it's safe as long as all these components are working properly. But sometimes things go wrong. This particular fixture happened out on the airfield here. Uh, we were called, there was a geyser shooting up about 20 feet in the air. Um, circuit was working just fine. We, uh, we went out there, opened it up, shut it down of course and then opened it up and this is what we found. It had been so hot inside of there that it actually melted the aluminum off of the back of the fixture. So here's a close-up of that same fixture or the the transformer wiring that comes to the fixture. This was the low voltage wiring that went to our light. Now I can guarantee you that after this happened that light was no longer being fed by low voltage. That was high voltage going to that light. And the interesting thing about this is that this circuit was fully functional. We would have never known. It, it didn't even burp. It was just on fire, that's all. Here's another fixture that we had. This was from a taxiway edge light. We went out there and uh, the light didn't work, so we put a new bulb in it, still didn't work. We replaced the fixture, still didn't work, so we opened up the fixture and we were pretty shocked to find this down below. And this circuit was still functioning just perfectly. Would have never known. So I'm gonna talk about some hazards with airfield lighting, constant current systems. Now. I need to tell you that I'm not trying to teach you how to be an electrician. And by watching what I'm trying to explain here, this doesn't give you the, the knowledge base to go out and work on these systems. Um, but what I'm hoping to do here is to give you enough information that you can start to recognize the hazards and maybe avoid getting into trouble and getting, finding the dangerous uh, situations. So we're gonna work on three different hazards. The first is faults. The second is open circuits. And the third is transformer failures. So I'm gonna start with the last one, transformer failures. So this is a typ typical isolation transformer and how it works. Um, I just made these pictures up. So these are cutaways, um, very simplified, but, but really this is not a very complicated system. The high voltage comes in and it wraps around an iron core and then it goes back out and it goes on to the next fixture. On that same iron core, you have a wrap of wire that comes out and goes to your light and back. And that high voltage is reduced and induced into the low voltage side. It all works fine until something goes wrong. Now these wires are in very close proximity to each other. But I should also say that there is no transfer of energy um, directly between the primary side and the secondary side. It's insulated. But something goes, can go wrong, and if we have a breach there or a fault, it's very easy to put high voltage into our secondary side. Now, we used to think that this was a really isolated incident that, you know, possibly it didn't even happen really. Um, until we started looking, recognizing it and looking for it. And the more we looked for it, the more of these we found. We actually found lots of them. We've, since uh, I started doing this video, um, we've probably found at least 50, maybe more of these on our airfield. And I would guess that on your airfield, if you start looking, you're going to find them. So, Here's an isolation transformer. What we've done is we've connected a megometer to this transformer, which is gonna put a thousand volt charge onto this, this transformer. 
We, charge, we connected one end to the high voltage side of this transformer and one end to the low voltage lighting side of this transformer. We fired it up and it's showing, it's maxing out this meter at 4,000 mega ohms. So that means there is no transfer of energy or, or conductivity between the high voltage coils and the low voltage coils. This is what a transformer should do. If it does anything other than this, it's a bad transformer. So if there was anything wrong with this transformer right here, this mega would give us a lower reading. So we might end up with uh, 200 kilo ohms, 200,000 ohms, rather than 4,000 million ohms. Uh, so it would be lower. Or if there was a dead short in there, we might get even zero ohms across between the two. But it doesn't take a huge short to allow the high voltage to transfer over to the secondary. Sometimes the shorts, or the faults are obvious. And this one obviously has zero, zero ohms between the primary and the secondary. So this one was definitely feeding high voltage up to the fixture. This particular fixture here, you can see we are attached to the high voltage side and we just attached it to the base of the light fixture itself. So this isn't even attached to the wire and it's showing us zero ohms between the primary and the light fixture. So this goes to show you that it's almost a direct connection between your 5,000 volt line and this light fixture. So that was a definite dangerous situation right there. So the next thing we're going to talk about is faults. Now a fault is just a, a break in the insulation somehow. It could be in the wires, it could be in the transformers, it could be everywhere, anywhere. Um, now a single fault doesn't go anywhere. It just sits there. And the reason it does that is because air fuel lighting is an ungrounded system. Now I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying, our system is grounded. We pull a ground wire in every single can and every single conduit on our airfield. Well, just because you're pulling a ground wire in there doesn't mean you have a grounded system. A lot of people don't understand this. And so I think we need to talk about this a lot more here in order to understand how this system works. These connectors here are the ones we use out on the airfield. We call them joy connectors. And they're real simple. It's basically just a male and a female connection on, in a rubber plug. That's pretty much all there is to it. They just mate together kind of tightly, sort of a seal right there. Normally we'll put a little bit of rubber tape around them, maybe a little mm -hmm. other tape. And that's good enough to put 5,000 5, volts on it. We can stuff that down in a can full of water and potassium acetate hit it with 5,000 volts and it's good as can be. Now, if the power company that's, that uh, sends power to your home was to use a connection like this in their 4160 lines, that's typically their, their transmission lines feeding uh, uh, your transformers in your homes would probably be about 4160 volts. If they were to feed your house in underground circuits with connections like this, if they took a, um, 4160 line and stuffed it into a metal can with water in it and they turned on the switch, it's going to explode. So why can we get away with using this kind of a connection and they can't get away with it? Well, the reason is, is that our system is ungrounded and their system is grounded. So we'll explain this a little bit more. So I've drawn a couple of pictures here of uh, a three-phase transformer here on a constant voltage system and a constant current transformer or regulator here that we would use out in the airfield. These are very simplified. They're not exactly accurate, but they're just to pr prove a point that I'm trying to show you here. Now on a constant voltage system, in a three-phase system, you have three different coils coming off. And from any one of these coils to ground, you'll get a voltage. So this is 120 volts to ground. And you'll notice that the ground connects right to the center of the transformer. The center tap of the transformer is grounded. Now from any one of the 
of the transformer leads going out to our lights from the hot side to the other side, which we call the neutral, you're going to have 120 volts. And the neutral is bonded at the center tap of the transformer to the ground. So neutral and ground have the same potential and it is 120 volts away from our, our transformer lead. Now on a constant current transformer, the, the uh, current and voltage that we're using on the field is induced through the regulator. So we have a, a grounded transformer on this side and it induces a voltage and amperage across an insulated barrier to the opposite side that goes out to our field. And on this side, we're grounded. But on this side, there is no ground connected to that transformer at all. It's like it's floating. There is no ground bond. So on this side of the transformer, on the primary side, we have, this is a 480 volt transformer. We have 480, 277 volts. So we have a 277 volt um, potential to ground on this side. But on this side, there is zero volts potential to ground. Let me explain this one more time here to try to, try to help understand this grounding one more way. This could be a little confusing to you. Here's a piece of ground wire from out, out on our airfield. <clears throat> Let's imagine that I just connected it to a ground rod to earth ground and we had a good solid ground to earth right here. If I was to take this D cell battery and I was to touch it to one side of the battery to our ground wire, would it discharge? Now we all know it wouldn't discharge, not at all because the, the electricity that's in this battery wants to get from this side of the battery to this side of the battery. And it doesn't care about going anywhere else. Going to ground won't get it over to this side of the battery, right? And that's very much like our regulator. The current in this regulator wants to get from this side of the regulator to that side. The only way it's going to do it is to go through our system and to get to the other side. So what would happen if I had my battery connected to this wire and I brought this part of the wire down, the ground wire, and I touched it to the battery, would it discharge? Yes, it would absolutely completely discharge to that wire. So it's not discharging to ground, it's discharging on the ground wire to itself. And that's what happens in our constant current system. So if a single fault doesn't go anywhere. We could call it a sleeper. But what happens if we have two faults out there? So in this situation, we have a single fault. And the electricity has it could go to ground, but it won't get it any closer to this side of the transformer where it wants to go. So it's like a dead end street. It won't go down that way. But in this situation, if we have two faults somewhere in the system out there, it will jump out onto the ground wire and use the ground wire as a path to get back into our system at a different point. The reason it'll do that is because electricity follows the path of least resistance. And so there is more resistance in our wiring which has lighting in it than there is on the ground wire or the, or the pipe that's in the ground or the water in the ground. And so it will use that instead of our lights. What you'll tend to see are lights out in that situation. But in this situation, you have up to 5,000 volts potential to jump across out of that wire onto that ground. So here we have zero volts. All of a sudden, because we have two faults, we have up to 5,000 volts potential. I've heard it said constant current is a safer type of electrical system because it's not seeking ground. So you could walk over and you could touch a fault. You could touch a bare wire. And because it's not seeking ground, it's not going to try to come to ground through you. And so it's safer. Well, actually, that's a true statement. But it's also a really 
stupid statement, and it's a good way to get killed. Because if, you, if everything in this system is perfect, except for the one place that you touch that wire, yes, it will not jump through you. But if there is another fault out there anywhere on that system, and you touch that wire, you will become the second fault. It will use you to get to the ground system, to follow the ground, to get back into the system and back in. And this constant current system will run all the lights right through you. Well, if you have two faults in the system and you're gonna have lights out out there, this happens to us once in a while. It's not a panic situation. Um, it's actually very nice when you get two lights out or, or a bunch of lights out in a row because you know right where your faults are. We can go right to either end and that's where we're going to find our problems. I wouldn't go playing around with it and I wouldn't go walking around on it, but it's not super dangerous. Um, it's, everything is going on down under the ground. But there are situations where faults become very dangerous and this is the situation. An isolation transformer can fail, and we know they do fail, and far more often than we ever thought. Okay, so if the transformer fails, and it puts high voltage to our light, what would happen if the electrician pulls that light out while it's still energized? Well, this is what would happen it's going to still be seeking to get back to ground because you've dis disturbed that connection to ground. And it's going to go out of the electrician's, up the electrician's arm and out his knee and back to ground. And if this happens to you, it's probably going to be fatal. Of course, otherwise you could ask, look like this also. Don't let this happen to you. But in all seriousness, this did happen to a, a gentleman out in Bethel, Alaska some years ago. He pulled a light that was still powered up. This was the transformer that was waiting for him underground. It, the electricity went through his arm and out his foot, shocked him really badly. Uh, he went to the hospital. Luckily, he wasn't hurt. Uh, seriously, he was released the same day. Um, it could have been much different. This is a connector for a taxiway edge light from Anchorage International Airport. Uh, one of our electricians saw this light was out, replaced the bulb, didn't work, so he just pulled it out of the ground. A big fireball came out at his feet. He was, this was a very close call. It had a primary secondary fault in the transformer, but luckily it was blowing out to ground right at the connector and not at the top of the, of the light fixture. Had it been higher in the light fixture and he had been pulling it out, it would have went through him to get back to ground. As it was, it just blew across in the ground. So it was a close call. Here's a, another situation that can happen with an isolation transformer fault going through a taxiway center line. The taxiway center line is a big hunk of aluminum. It can be carrying that current and you'll never know it. Um, it wouldn't even warm up. But this is the spot right here. This transition right here is what we need to focus on. What happens if this fixture is lifted away? The electrician pulls it away, breaks it from its ground connection, and it's going to go through him. Electricians have been found dead with burns on their hands and burns on their knees. It's a very serious situation. If this happens to you, it will probably kill you. So it's very important here at Anchorage, if we work on a light, we lock it out. We make sure that it's turned off and that it cannot be turned on while we're working on it. It's important for you to, to find a way to create a uh, lockout tagout plan at your airport and follow it. I threw a few so slides in here of just an interesting way that we've done some, some troubleshooting. We, we have a FLIR camera. camera. It's a forward-looking infrared camera. In the wintertime, it's very difficult to troubleshoot our lights because we have ice in the cans, snow all around. It's hard to find problems. So we started driving around with, with this camera hanging out the window, pointing at the different lights, and we found that if there was a problem in the can, especially an isolation transformer fault, it would start to show up as heat at the base of the can. 
So this particular one was a, a pretty mild isolation transformer fault. This particular one was 118 degrees. It was actually on fire under the ground. And we were able to find it pretty quickly. So it's a good tool, just handy. I just threw that in because I thought you might like it. Really, one of the biggest dangers with constant current is the open circuit. OK, so in order to understand how dangerous it is to have an open circuit, you have to understand how a regulator works. OK? A regulator's job is to maintain a constant amperage across the, this lighting circuit. Okay? It does that by varying the voltage up and down in order to push the right amount of current through that, that wire. Now, a lot of people don't understand amps and volts, so I'm going to put this a little different way in order to kind of help you. If this were a water system, and we had a water pipe going out into our field, and we were trying to push a certain amount of water, we would be looking for gallons per minute of water flowing through a pipe. Now, that gallons per minute would be a flow of molecules of water, right? Instead of gallons per minute, in a regulator, we're using amperage. And it is a flow of electrons through a wire. And instead of gallons per minute, it is amps, OK? So if this were water, we're trying to maintain 6.6 .6 gallons per minute. Instead of voltage in, with water, we, this would be our pump. And we would be trying to use pressure to push that amount of water through the pipe, right? So this would be our 2,250 volts, but instead, let's say it was 2,250 PSI of water pressure. So if we're trying to maintain this 6.6 .6 amps or 6.6 .6 gallons per minute, if this was to rise up higher than we wanted, what we would do is back off our pump and lower our pump pressure, or with an electrical system, we would lower our voltage. It would push fewer amps or less water, and it would bring it back to where we want. OK, if it was to drop down low, we would increase our volts or increase our pump pressure, and we would push more amps or or, or more electrons, or we would push more water in order to get our gallons per minute or our amperage back to where we want it. OK. So what happens if we were to take a live constant current connector and pop it open? Our amps are going to drop down to zero. Our volts are going to go right through the roof. This, this regulator is going to say, I've got to get these amps up. This is my job to maintain 6.6 .6 amps in here. And I'm going to give it everything I have, all the volts I can put out, in order to try to make those amps flow through this wire. And it will. It'll put out between 9 and 10,000 volts. And it will jump a blue arc two to three feet between these connectors. Now, our bodies are made out of, out of uh, we're filled with salty blood. We have a lot of nerves that conduct electricity very well. Uh, what are the chances that it might seek us as a path to get through that circuit? Odds are pretty good. At 10,000 volts, all it has to do is jump from your thumb to your thumb, and it's going to use you as a conductor. Now, if it can pass through you, and it can keep its voltage down below 5,000 volts, it won't shut off. It's going to keep running the circuit right through you. And it, it won't even know you're there. That's how dangerous it is. It will kill you if you do that. So there's some rules to avoid open circuit hazards. 
And um, these are what I learned with. The first is never under any circumstances break a live constant current circuit. The second, assume that every constant current circuit is live until it's proven otherwise. I think of it as a gun. It's always loaded until you prove otherwise and treat it as such. And lastly, always check the current in, in the wire with a clamp on ammeter before breaking any constant current uh, connection and or the S1 cutout in the, in, the, um, in the regulator room. Now this is a, this is your amp or clamp on ammeter. <clears throat> it, uh, if you clamp it on, turn it to amps. If there's any flow in that, in that wire, it should show. If, if it shows zero, it should be good to open up your circuit. Do you know your ammeter is working or not? It's important to know that. So the only for sure way to know your ammeter is working is to clamp onto a live circuit clamp onto the circuit that you're concerned with, see that there's zero volts, or zero amps, I should say, and then clamp onto live again and check your, your meter and make sure that it's showing amps. Then you know 100% certain that that is dead. And I'll tell you that that is almost impossible to do out in the airfield. You're not gonna be able to do that. So it's important that you check your clamp on ammeter back at the shop once in a while. Now, you can, uh, you can print these on the board at your, at your break room. Um, you can even you know, put this in your truck so everybody is reminded all the time. But unless you have a meter, you're not going to have it to check the, your, your circuits, okay? And if you buy yourself a meter and you leave it back at the shop, you're not going to have that meter when you need to check your circuits. So the only way to, to make sure that these rules are going to work for you is to have that meter handy. Now, here at Anchorage, we developed a little system, and we call it the takedown box. So the idea was to build a little shadow box. It has the basic tools that we need every time we go into a live circuit or a potentially live circuit. We have pry bars for getting uh, center lines out. We have NACs, we have washers, a uh, little place for garbage. This particular tool is our voltage detector. And this is also where we keep our clamp on ammeter. The idea is, is that every time we need to get into a live or a, a circuit, we will use these tools. And so that's the perfect place to keep our safety equipment. There is no excuse to not whip out the ammeter and clamp on if it's right there. Now I do know of one story of a, a gentleman who was working on an airfield. He was issued a clamp on ammeter. I assume that maybe it was in his truck. The truck was uh, more than 50 feet away from where he was working. His partner went to get the truck to move it closer to where he was working and when his partner came back, the gentleman had cut into a uh, live wire and he was dead. He had not checked with the ammeter. The ammeter was probably in the truck. So having your safety tool right with you is very important. You should clamp on every time before you cut into or open up a constant current system. So now, some things that you should have learned here. You should notify electricians immediately if you see exposed wires, a hot or steaming fixture or steam erupting from a, a can, many lamps out in a row, damaged lids or, or in-pavement fixtures, free donuts. Now, if you call the electricians every once in a while because there's free donuts, that means they will answer the phone every single time you call, so it's important. Never touch or go near exposed wiring. Never attempt to plug a connector back together. 
especially a live connector. Don't pick up fixtures that are still attached to the can on a live circuit. So if a taxiway edge light is broken free from its frangible and it's laying there but still attached to the can, make sure the circuit is dead before you grab hold of that, that light because it could have a uh, short going to the can. And if you see a problem out there, the best thing to do, what I like to do, is use the rule of thumb. And that is, hold your thumb up at arm's length and back up until the problem is completely covered by your thumb and then stay there. It works every time. So for more information, the AC Circulars is a great place to look. This particular one on safety is an excellent source. So for questions right now, you should know the basic components of our electrical system, why it's different than most electrical systems that we use every day, why it can be more dangerous, what to do or not to do if you see problems, and when to call the electricians, and if not, you need to ask. All right, so you've learned a lot about an airfield electrical system. One of the things I'm sure you've figured out is that in order to get heard on this system, there have to be a lot of things aligned. You have to, everything has to be just right for it to be, to electrocute you. But the problem with that is, is that it breeds complacency. You might be able to pull these lights live a thousand times and never get hurt, or maybe a hundred times. Or maybe the next time you pull one of these lights, it's going to electrocute you. So you gotta ask yourself, am I feeling lucky today? The goal of this video has been to get each and every one of you guys that work on an airfield home each night to spend time with your families. The only way that's gonna happen is if you decide that you're going to be safe and you're going to follow the rules around these electrical systems. I hope you do it.